Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University, and we're trying to get closer to the truth about health and healthcare. This week, we will be speaking with Dr. Vinit Arora. But first, what's got your attention this week, Harlan? Hey, Howie. I thought, first of all, I might just do some quick updates about what's going on in infectious disease. I mean, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've been laser focused now on the way in which viruses, you know, run through our society. And right now we've got three that are occupying our attention. I mean, that's not even counting monkeypox, but, you know, the RSV cases continue to to go up. Uh, We're doing a lot of testing. And I think that there's some good news, which is positivity rates seem to be kind of coming down. Um, You know, if we look back in previous seasons, I mean, RSV season usually lasts about five months. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen here. We're getting a lot of reports from children's hospitals and the places that there seem to be more, maybe more severe cases than there have been in typical seasons, which are leading to to people ending up being hospitalized. Again, it represents a very small number of people of all those who are infected, but it's always catastrophic when a child needs that kind of attention. And so we're going to we have to see what happens in Thanksgiving. I think a, a bigger story to me is what's going to happen with flu. So if you look at at the flu cases, uh, it's it's flu starting a bit earlier, and the the sort of curve the is steeper than what we've seen in many of the other uh, flu seasons. So it means it's starting earlier and it's going up more rapidly than than what we've seen. Of course, there's as always regional variation, and it seems, for example, that the states that are getting hit hardest right now are in the south and the uh, and in the mid Atlantic. But, um, you know, we're going to have to keep an eye on this. And in a way, because we've been masking over these past few seasons and we almost had a non-existent flu season, you know, in the, in the past couple of years, you know, people might be more primed to be affected by flu. And it shouldn't surprise us that this could be a difficult flu season. That's just what we need on top of everything else. But, but that might be what, what's going to be. And then so we've got to keep our eye on that. We're just at the beginning. And then covid is, you know, we're at a moment where, I don't know, there are more than 300 subvariants that are running around the world, and there's not one that's dominating globally. And that's kind of a of a new thing, because we were always like, well, here's here they are, and then one out competes the rest of them and, and ends up becoming dominant. But, but right now, we're seeing just a lot of different variants. And the, the hotspots right now, you know, seem to be in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific region, uh, Western Pacific region, but we're going to, you know, have to keep keep an eye on this. Again, in the U.S., the cases are coming going. There's some regional differences, but we're not seeing marked evidence of, you know, the kind of spread and spike that we thought we might see at this time. We'll see what happens in the winter. I attribute this to, there are a lot of people who either been infected, a fair number of people who've been fully vaccinated. The kind of country probably is in a position now where it's able to defend a little bit better, from this infection, but we also know that this protection wanes over time. So as the vi- variants evolve and our, our protection wanes, you know, I, I mean, I'm just singing the same song, which is we're just going to have to stay ever vigilant about this. The, the wastewater monitoring across the, the U.S. has been it shows that a relatively flat right now. So I think it's saying that we're keeping this at bay. But um, if I just want to respond to that, the one thing I'll say anecdotally, because I'm in the ER just enough to be able to know what's going on in the ER with the respiratory illnesses, and it is not at a level that surprises me at all. In fact, I see almost no cases of sort of COVID lung or bad pneumonias associated with influenza, um, or even quite frankly, RSV cases that are surprising me. So from an acuity point of view, the numbers may be very high, but from an acuity standpoint, it's not that different than previous outbreaks that we've seen. And when it comes to COVID, it's substantially lower. The acquired immunity that we have either through vaccination or prior infection is preventing really bad pulmonary cases. That doesn't mean it's preventing other uh, systemic problems. Or long COVID. But yeah, I think for the moment, we're still representing a bit of a hiatus. Dr. Vinit Arora is the Herbert T. Abelson Professor of Medicine and Dean for Medical Education at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. She specializes in improving the quality of medical education, focusing her work on a learning environment for medical trainees. 
She is a scholarly expert on patient handoffs and hospital medicine, which she continues to practice. She uses social media exceptionally well, both for her academic teaching prowess, as well as for the broader goal of improving the public's health. Dr. Aurora has won awards from the Society of Hospital Medicine, the Society of General Internal Medicine, and more. She has been recognized as a master educator at the University of Chicago and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. She received a BA from Hopkins, an MD from Washington University in St. Louis, completed her internal medicine residency and fellowship at the University of Chicago, and earned a master's degree from the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. So first of all, Dean Aurora, welcome to the Health and Veritas podcast. You are a multi-talented physician, scholar, educator, and so I struggled uh, for where we would start. But your academic work around advocacy and misinformation have stood out, particularly during the pandemic. In May of this year, you followed that up with a perspective piece with colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine urging that we do more to prepare healthcare professionals to push back at healthcare misinformation as well as other measures to support them in that effort. So with the recent takeover of Twitter by Elon Musk, are you more or are you less concerned? What can we do? What, what recommendations can you give our listeners? Thank you so much for having me here. It's lovely to be here with you, Howie and Harlan, and uh, it feels like being with old friends. And um, uh, so let's go to Twitter. Let's dive right in. <laughs> and so, um, you know, Elon Musk, or sometimes Elephant Tusk, as I've seen him being called on Twitter, uh, in an, in, and to keep anonymity, um, I would say, um, certainly, um, I'm very concerned about the future of Twitter. Uh, I, I kind of use social media and a lot of different platforms. Uh, and so but Twitter was my gateway drug, as I like to say, and that was kind of how I got involved. I had a Twitter account before I had LinkedIn, before even I had Facebook, which was unique for my generation. That was really the, the platform that drew me in. And, um, and I've been on it for a long time. I was one of the earliest people on the medical education hashtag and you know, still remember those early days on Twitter. And I am very sad. I was just recently at the Association of American Medical Colleges meetings with other deans from medical schools and leaders in medical education. And top of mind was, what are we going to do? Because we, we, you know, we built a community, and um, and everyone expressed their sadness. And I think they expressed their sadness because the value of social media is in the community, and um, and the recent um, initiatives by you know, Elon Musk have really, you know, decimated the community. We're losing followers. And then the announcements are being made about um, the verification process being, uh, you know, up for sale. And um, and then most recently with the parody accounts, even in Elon Musk's name, highlighting the vulnerabilities of that platform. And, you know, just even the, you know, Eli Lilly with the free insulin, you know, like this is, you know, most people don't have the time or the savviness to be like, let me go dissect what's true and what's false. And so literally having an announcement like that, we know that false information spreads like wildfire. It spreads like wildfire in the resident workroom. It spreads like wildfire on Twitter. And and unless we've got the staff, the human element to adjudicate those things, which I know a lot of staff have been let go at Twitter, we're going to see that platform fall apart. And that's what we're, I, some people are speculating it's just a matter of weeks. And so, um, you know, I'm still there and I'm watching, but I've, I've diversified my, my own personal use. I've, I've started Mastodon. I've been on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is a platform I started using much more during the pandemic um, when I was associate chief medical officer in charge of engagement. I noticed a lot of our nurses were on LinkedIn and people were posting, you know, their pride for the organization. And so that's been an interesting journey to follow. As well, so I, I think that you know social media is not dying, but a platform may be dying, and we need to think about how to how to safeguard future platforms from this. Do you want to just briefly follow up and tell our listeners about the Eli Lilly insulin issue? Because for the three of us, we know about it from Twitter, but many people aren't even on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, yeah, you'll you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Please jump in. But I think that. Um, 
with the new verification uh, up for sale, you know, uh, Twitter Blue, um, it's easy to make a parody account. Now you have to say you're a parody account. But before, um, a lot of parody accounts popped up, including Elon Musk's parody account that just said, oh, I'm Elon Musk, use the same picture, same with Eli Lilly. And then one of the first uh, tweets from this supposed parody account that looked identical to the real account was, we're going to give insulin, you know, for free. And, um, and it got retweeted, you know, sent around the world. And, um, and I think initially when I saw it, I'll be honest, when I saw it for a moment, I was like, what, you know, um, and because it, it was, you know, your brain is just processing the information quickly and you're like, what is this? And you, you had to pause and take a look and then explode the replies to understand what was really happening. And, um, and you know, that's an example of health misinformation that, that affects millions of people, you know, who are on insulin. But it also, you know, it was like right in the, you know, week, you know, maybe even the days, like right before the midterm election. And we know that misinformation and disinformation isn't just a problem in healthcare. It's a problem for governments. It's a problem that's, uh, you know, really um, underlying dem democracies and uh, countries. And so, um, it, it, you know, it's like uh, we, we had a piece in stat. Um, when, when the New England Journal article came out that you mentioned, we had a piece in Stat, a companion piece that talked about the bot holiday, which was when, you know, Ukraine was invaded by Russia. What a lot of us noticed that we were on Twitter kind of like promoting vaccination was that the bots who were initially accounts that were attacking us for promoting vaccination went quiet. It was like the eye of Sauron for any Lord of the Rings fans out there, you know, was diverted away to to the, you know, to Ukraine. And then all of a sudden, then, you know, people have, uh, have actually done studies to show that the same accounts that really, you know, um, promote Russia and agree with Russia also disagree with vaccination, you know, 80% overlap. And so clearly there is this uh, manufactured war out there, you know, that on social media. And so that's why it's important that, um, you know, that healthcare workers are aware and engage. I wonder, just as a quick follow-up to the other thing you said, you said you're considering using Mastodon. Do you want to just say, comment about that? And and what do you think if people flee Twitter? Well, you know, what are the? Uh, is there an option to be yeah. able to reconstitute the community? Yeah. So I, um, you know, so as an early adopter of Twitter, I will say that I, I kind of had been. Um, telling people that I was moving away from Twitter, you know, even though I love Twitter and I've given talks about Twitter, I actually started telling people earlier this year, you know, I move over to LinkedIn, I'm moving over to LinkedIn and started doing more on LinkedIn because the vitriol on Twitter was so extreme. And, um, you know, I, I found it to be like, you, you know, like we're all burned out. And then like, who wants to try to promote vaccination or, you know, public health measures, or even just talk about, diversity, equity, and inclusion, like things that we value in medical education, and then be quote tweeted and, you know, have right wing folks uh, that are, you know, after you for valuing certain things. And so I felt that civil discourse had died on Twitter. And so, um, so I'd been sort of moderating my use. And, um, and, you know, when when the opportunity I learned to join Mastodon came up, I was like, Oh, gosh, I don't know if I can learn another platform. And there's a guy I follow on Twitter named Nick Mark, who's Dr. Nick, and he um, he had posted that he created a med Mastodon server. And I heard that Mastodon was sort of this federated universe of like planets, if you will, <laughs> and, and you have to choose what planet you're going to be on. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm not ready to join the big Mastodon, but I can you know follow my friends over to the med Mastodon and learn. And um, and I went over there and I just announced I, I'm going over and I actually was really surprised. I saw a lot of people I know. I saw a lot of people who followed me. And um, and then at the conference that I was at, a lot of people were like, where are you going? Did you join Mastodon? And so that it's getting a lot of buzz, a lot of pickup. Um, the challenge what, with What's Mastodon, the advantage of it? How do they manage the, the filtering and so forth? So there's one thing that's really unique about Mastodon that I like, which is that you cannot quote tweet somebody. And I've started to realize that it's sort of like a way to quell a little bit of the violence out there uh, because you can reply to somebody and engage in the discourse, but you can't basically say, I'm going to amplify this person and just trash them to all of my followers, you know? 
Um, the other advantage of Mastodon is it's still early. So it reminds me of early Twitter. It's got an interesting vibe, techy, you know, very little geeky, you know, um, which is sort of what I like. And um, and people are learning. They're learning together how to use it. They're like, how does this work? You know, I, I, you know, Nick releases emojis and icons, you know, and we're like, oh, that's interesting. And um, and there's a way to link your Twitter account to your Mastodon account so that um, for you know, for folks like me, you know, I don't, I, you know, early Twitter in 2009, I had a lot more time than I have now. I don't have a lot of time right now. So for me, it has to fit into my work day. And so when I was at the conference, I, when I would post to Twitter, I would auto post to Mastodon. I was getting more robust interest and replies on Mastodon than on Twitter, like better answers and questions. And I realized that that my community, people who want to engage, were were moving over to Mastodon, and they were like, "Please reply on Mastodon." And I moved over, and I would reply to them. And so, um, with all social media, you get what you put in. Um, and so, I think that the, we're growing as Mastodon grows, and we're going to learn from that. The interesting thing about it is it's not owned by, you know, it has one owner, but these universes are like these, it's like being in a Facebook group with a moderator. The moderator has a lot of influence and so trust in the moderator. And this guy, Nick, he um, he created this like medical education, like um, kind of shorthand ICU pearls during the pandemic that got a lot of traction. And so that's one of the reasons I started following him, sort of being a trusted person to be like, okay, if you're redeployed to the ICU, here's this ICU pearls that you can that you can um, follow along. And so I felt he had, he has a good heart. His you know, missions in the right place. And that was what drew me to being like, okay, I have a trusted person who I think would do a good job moderating all of this on Mastodon. But I don't know where we're going to end up. So, you know, I don't know. Have you guys switched to Mastodon? <laughs> so. No, but I, after hearing you, I think it might be worth it. I have an account there, but I, yeah, oh, I have an account, that. but I, I know, I, I follow you. <laughs> I've used, yeah, it's a much more limited thing because, as you said, it's federated, and I yeah. just joined on the social one, yeah. and so you have to figure out like where where to survive. I may think about switching to your uh, to your your um, server. Yeah, it's it's yeah, growing can... exponentially, but it's clunky. I mean, I tell you know, and then I posted on Mastodon. This is so clunky. What do we do? And what you know what I, the answer I got was. The clunkiness is us. Like we, we embrace the clunkiness, you know. <laughs> so, um, so there is a little bit of a culture of Mastodon right now, and so that's something that um, we have to respect. There are people that are there, you know, and there's a Twitter migration, and so what will that do to the culture of Mastodon is an important question for those who really like Mastodon. That's nice. Now you guys, you guys are ahead of me. I'm going to have to try to catch up and and check this out. I, I wanted to just pivot to one other. A quick area. Uh, the world of medicine is changing so rapidly, and yet a lot of the teaching and approach to education is still anchored in the past. And, and in a way, we're teaching medicine from the past and not looking forward to the future, a future that's going to have a lot of televisits, that's, that social media is a big part of, that, that people are going to be having mobile devices, there's going to be a lot of DIY stuff out there. You know, there's a there's an ecosystem of medicine in the future that's going to be vastly different than the one that we grew up in. And yet, even when I wrote this piece and said, you know, I think the stethoscope we're going to, you know, is not providing important information. And is, I, I said, stethoscope is dead. It's nice to show. But if you do study after study after study about skills people have with auscultation, it reveals that doctors are no longer able to discern heart sounds in ways that have diagnostic accuracy. And whether they could 40, 50 years ago, I don't know, but I know what now, it's not good. And I know we've got sensor technology that could just solve this problem. It's merely pattern recognition. And, and the blowback was like, how can you possibly say that? We've got to be doing this like Linac. We've got to be putting the stethoscope on. And even though, you know, without even just recognizing, no, maybe we need to move on from what, what's not working, what is working. And so how are you thinking about this as you're educating people, engaging in curricula, in trying to create objectives about what, what people need to know? Uh, you know, it's a challenge, right? The world's, yeah. the world's rapidly evolving. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's such a great question. And thanks, uh, thanks for, uh, you know, this uh, amazing question that comes at a time that we, I'm thinking about this a lot. And so, um, you know, I, I actually moved over from the health system leadership to educational leadership to take this role. And it struck me, you know, I, I was knee deep in pandemic operations and how 
much innovation we stood up. And then I came over to the medical school and I was like, wow, you know, we have a traditional curriculum, you know, and it's still a one to many lecture, you know, and, and we know a lot about learning. We know a lot about active learning and immersive learning, simulation, technology and education, even as advancing. Um, but I do think that we are very slow adopters in medical education. And why is that? Um, one reason is funding. You know, I mean, there's just not like the NIH of medical education to accelerate, you know, innovations. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I think we all know in academic health centers with that tripartite mission, education happens to be sort of the afterthought sometimes, and it really needs to be up front and center. Um, and then I do think that we sometimes get stuck into this rinse and repeat cycle and change is very hard. And, um, you know, even the way we change, the emotions of change, um, you know, trainees hate change, right? So sometimes that sort of keeps us anchored in an old reality. But I mean, I, I am really struck by the way the pace of digital health, AI, you know, even the practice of medicine, like, you know, when I go attend is changing, but we're still stuck teaching kind of old methods. And so, um, in fact, sometimes we hear people say, I know you learned this second year or first year this way, but here's how you really should present. And I'm like, why, why are we saying that, you know? And so, um, so how can we reconcile this? And so, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we have done is to launch curriculum renewal here. So within the first 90 days, uh, you know, I you know, I've looked at a lot of leadership books. I used the social capital and timing I had. Uh, we have not changed our curriculum since 2009, but we have an amazing team here ready to change. And I, you know, looked at a lot of change management, um, you know, principles. Le leveraged a lot of you know public policy, organizational policy theory that I had um, learned, and. Um, and thought, you know, well, if we're going to change, it's got to be now, and I can be the per the turnaround person um, to to do it with at least bring the vision while I've got this amazing team who's going to be build the architecture. And so, within the first ninety days, we launched a, a curriculum change here called Evolves, a renewal process, ensuring a vision of leading with our values. And the reason that that name was so important is because we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? The mission and vision, you know, we we feel is very important here. And we're here in the south side of Chicago. We are the only top 20 research medical school that's also on the top 10 most diverse uh, ranked list uh, with 36% of our students coming in underrepresented in medicine. Um, a third are coming in identifying as LGBTQ+. Um, and so, and, and we have doubled the number of students from low income households. So we have really tried to live and breathe um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lot of this work predates my arrival. You know, I'm inheriting this work from amazing leaders. And, um, but we want to be important cultural stewards of that. Like, we don't want that to get lost. And also, why do people come here? They come here for this health equity, social justice mission, learning about healthcare system science and being immersed here in the University of Chicago and um, also to serve our patients, you know, and, and, uh, and our community. And so, um, so that was, we did a, you know, we, I, I'm very data driven. So we, we started with crowdsourcing. We sent out a survey to everybody in phase one, said, tell us your ideas, but also tell us what you want to preserve. And they, we had alumni, residents, you know, faculty, all sorts of people engaged, students. And, and it allowed people to feel that the change was coming and they could ha contribute to the change. And so, and this is, they told us a lot of this. They told us what they value. They also told us what they need changed. And what they, we have a very traditional two plus two curriculum and it's very lecture heavy in the preclinical. And so um, they really valued also this focus on research. We have amazing students who do, you know, they're always presenting at conferences and, you know, 90, 90 plus percent of them publish in peer reviewed um, abstract or publication format, um, which is not even a requirement, but they, it's like well above national average. So. So they told us what they wanted preserved, but they also told us what we they wanted changed, and we had to listen to that. And, and that meant some critical conversations, right? We're at a biological sciences division where, um, you know, we, we, we are co-sharing our building with basic scientists, and we need to bring everyone to the table to say, how can we compress the curriculum but also use better techniques? And we are a school, not unlike others, that when the pandemic came, 
flipping a lecture to a Zoom with just boxes of 100 people and having that go on for nine to five. I mean, that's what I did at WashU in my curriculum. It's got a new curriculum now. It, it does not fly. And it actually compounded the mental health crisis that we are seeing in our in our young people. And um, and, you know, I, my, I saw this with my daughter, you know, so we we have to get to uh, building community, but active learning and, and, and deploying better engagement. The other thing that I will tell you is when I was in the hospital, we've always viewed students and residents as learners and like, you know, oh, you know, what can they do? It's always like a deficiency model, like, you know, oh, you, you're not, you can't do this yet, you know, make sure you, you know, dwell here and learn more. But how do you learn? You know, maybe you learn in a classroom and then you're going to go practice on a patient. Um, in the pandemic, something really interesting happened, which is the hospital opened its doors. Like I remember getting a call from the Hicks team being like, can you mobilize volunteers to help us with this, that, or the other thing? So we opened the doors and, and, you know, the students answered in droves. Like they were standing up telehealth, doing hotlines, building platforms, doing literature searches to support the COVID unit. You got it. Yeah. And so basically... You know, it showed us that our students and residents are more than just learners. You know, they they have value added roles they can play and learn from. And so that's what we're doing right now is how to really convert some of the things people were doing on a volunteer basis to say this is a learning experience and a value added experience and how to connect the dots so that you experience the health system and can actually contribute in an earlier way. I mean, Many of our students worked at Epic or, you know, took years off, et cetera. How do we deploy that and say, you are actually part of our team and here's how you're going to help. So that's that's a short, you know, kind of like a summary of our curriculum effort. This is what we came to hear. I, I want to bring one last thing up before uh, our time is over. Um, you introduced me to CO2 monitors and, and Harlan and I talked <laughs> yeah. offline about that. Yeah. But, but more importantly is you... There's an article in the New York Times this week that says as the pandemic drags on, uh, you know, some people can't let go or something like that. And it's true. There are people who are absolutely still living in fear. And then there are other people who just ignore the pandemic. You're smack dab in the middle using an evidence basis to make decisions about your life, about your career, about your children's lives, your, your husband, your family, and so on. Can you just give us a quick sense of like, how you think about the things you do in order to maintain what is, in my opinion, as close to normal as you can get while also being very protective of yourself and others against COVID? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I've definitely evolved my thinking, but I also have to think about people I protect. And so when I get close to traveling to see my family who are at risk um, or visiting other at-risk relatives, I, I am much more aggressive about things like masking and, and testing. Uh, but at the same time, there are things that I, 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 I want to live my life, you know, and I, I want to go to the conference and go to dinner with colleagues and friends. So I take calculated risks. A friend of mine who's a pediatrician is a big fan of Frozen. So she quotes Olaf from Frozen, which is some people aren't worth melting for, you know. And so the people on the plane when I'm traveling, I'm like, yeah. I don't have anything to against anyone, but I know statistically speaking, there is probably a, a higher risk here. So I'm going to mask up on the plane and in transit because there's nothing, nothing, you know, and I'm going to, you know, also teach my kids within reason to try to help do that. I mean, I also had a had a baby during the pandemic who was unvaccinated for a large portion of the pandemic. And when we got COVID, because we did, you know, it's hard when when everyone, you know, dropped masking. Um it came to us through the school and um, affected my son. And it was hard. I mean, it was he was sick. I mean, he was more sick than you would just say is mild. And um, he also had to be home for 10 days because at the time, CDC said, if you're unvaccinated and can't mask, you need to stay home for 10 days. So we could not have him in childcare for 10 days. And, uh, and that led to me missing uh, as a first year dean in medical education, um, a lot of graduation events and our reunion. And so I was like, this is a big compromise. And so I live and breathe it. And so I, we make decisions to support our students who are largely low risk, you know, uh, being able to gather and be social and make personal decisions. But we also want to be um, honest with the fact that there are gonna be people who wanna be protected at times. 
And um, we have doctors on our staff who are immunocompromised and staff who are immunocompromised. So we need to respect that as well. And so I wish there was better civil discourse about this and more empathy for each other um, I, because I see it both ways, right? And, um, and unfortunately, I don't see that a lot right now. So that really is painful. Well, I, I appreciate your thoughtfulness about this. Anyway, thank you so much. This is just terrific. Howie, she's got so much charisma. She's such a great communicator. I'm so glad that we were able to have her. We've got, we've got to have her back. And, and thankfully, hopefully, we can have that opportunity. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And uh, look forward to seeing you in person someday. So that was a great interview with Vinny, Howie. So let's pivot to the next segment. What's on your mind this week? Yeah, so, you know, one election outcome that I was not following uh, last week when last we spoke was the magic mushroom vote or Proposition 122 <laughs> in I Colorado. Really about this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it passed by a 5% margin. It decriminalizes the possession and use of hallucinogens by people over the age of 21. It begins to create a regulated environment so ha for their just use. Just to say, hallucinogens, so these are... Hallucinogens, yeah. These, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So this is like psilocybin. It's like LSD, but but psilocybin's the big one that I'm going to talk about. Uh, these are drugs that that induce hallucinations, and people have used recreationally, but now they have clinical use. And Oregon passed a similar bill about two years ago, and they're going to first start really putting it into place this coming January. So there's no state that really has an apparatus about this yet. And then this comes on the heel of a recently published study in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's about two or three weeks ago, that demonstrated a significant positive effect of a single dose of psilocybin, which is a hallucinogen uh, for the treatment-resistant depression. So this is a debilitating, it's also an all too common illness, you know, depression that does not respond to treatment. And therapeutic breakthroughs are few and far between otherwise, despite the fact that billions of dollars are being spent on this on several classes of drugs. So at first I was just fascinated by the study because hallucinogens have been purported to be effective for depression, for alcohol use disorder, and for anxiety for several years, but well done trials have been sparse until recently. This one that we're talking about today was, is a phase two trial, it's pretty compelling. But the accompanying editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine is what drew my attention. So almost conceding that the treatment likely works, at least in the shorter term, the author of the editorial raises serious questions about how this could be implemented in alignment with the trial. So, so get this, sessions are six to eight hours in duration. They're conducted in a non-clinical, calming, living room-like environment with participants listening to a specially designed music playlist and isolated by eye shades and earphones. At least two personnel are actively working with the patient during this time, and therapist training is considered intensive. Is this what the regulated environment in Oregon or Colorado is going to look like? It, you know, this is a risky drug. Uh, side effects were not insubstantial, by the way. They include nausea, vomiting, severe headache, but also suicidal ideation, self-harm, major depression, exacerbation. And there are going to be more trials to go before this treatment could really be mainstreamed clinically. But what we've learned from this trial is still valuable, and we're going to see synthetic drugs that might be safer for the future. So I personally am all for decriminalizing drug possession, drug use, and drug sales to people over the age of 21. In general, that's how I hold. But I am really worried that this therapy will be commercialized faster than the evidence might support. The trial I mentioned, by the way, is sponsored by just such a for-profit entity. And I'm hoping that the regulatory process in Colorado will follow the methodical process being enacted in Oregon and go really slow. This may well work, but these drugs can be very potent. We should continue to collect the best evidence and we should use it to guide the right therapy for each individual. Yeah, you're making a really good point, Howie. And I was talking to Jerry Santacora, who's one of our great psychiatrists uh, and re researchers here at, at Yale about this trial. I mean, let's just be clear for people listening. You know, it, it, it is a phase two double blind trial, but an early one, only 79 people. And, and there really was no control. They tested a 25 milligram group a 10 milligram group and a one milligram group. So they took everyone through all of this and they really were trying to see whether or not there was a difference 
in the dosing and what they saw was that the 25 milligram but not the 10 milligram uh, reduced depression scores more than the one milligram dose. So again, this this wasn't a large scale trial. And as Howie has described, you know, you could wonder whether or not some of the effect, you know, in the context of all of this, you know, was because of the kind of attention that they were getting and the context that was provided. Anyway, you're, you're right on, Howie, solid here, because, you know, it comes out and gets promoted as a positive trial, but you've got to really look at how it was executed. It's simply not scalable in this way. And it's not even clear to us, it's very small, that this thing is going to be what it means. And then meanwhile, they're passing laws to say people can, can try them recreationally. we got to be very careful with this. Yeah, you could easily imagine this being used recreationally very soon if Colorado and Oregon aren't, aren't careful about uh, how they roll this out. Yeah, absolutely. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K-E-L. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. You can also email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management. Thanks to our researcher, Jenny Tan, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. They are amazing. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Holland. Talk to you soon.